about that. As long as we get it recorded, we'll be good. Okay. So are you ready to start then, Dr. Myers? Yes, we can okay. start. Okay, so uh, first I wanna uh, you know, thank you all for uh, joining into our curriculum, our May curriculum meeting. And uh, I see we have a lot of teachers here, so I'm really excited to hear what the teachers are gonna be sharing about the instruction that you're doing. Uh, what happened? Oh, you do it, okay. All right, I didn't realize you were uh, doing some um, screen sharing. So, okay, so um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Winters. He's gonna be talking about the dual enrollment agreement. Uh, with RAC for next school year. So, Dr. Winters. Thank you, Dr. Sure. Clendon. Uh, this evening on the agenda, uh, we have three items. We're going to start with a discussion around the RAC dual enrollment agreement for 2021. Uh, this is something that we do every year through Reading Area Community College. And so, I'm going to bring up the agreement first and then the course list. We'll walk through it and see if there are any questions. Um, and ultimately, what we would be looking for is um, agreement from the uh, three board members on the curriculum committee, Dr. McClendon, Mrs. Wilson, and Dr. Hemberger, uh, to be in agreement of this uh, uh, dual enrollment uh, program, and then because it'll be voted on at the meeting uh, next week. So take a look at the agreement. Um, it's a pretty standard agreement from RAC. Um, some of you will recall that last year um, we approved something very similar. Uh, the beginning of the document gives just kind of a general description um, of what you know the program is for um, to provide high school students the opportunity to earn college credits while completing approved courses at their high school. Um, there are a series of guidelines that are established by the community college, um, that those that are offered um, between agreement with the high school and the community college, um, that that agreement has to go both ways. They have to meet the standard contact hour requirement that the community college has. Um, most of these courses would be typical freshman level for, uh, classes found in first or second year college curricula. Um, everything has to be approved by the academic division at the community college. So the course, the instructor, the textbook, um, et cetera. Um, if there's a change of instructor, that has to be improved by the community college as well. Um, the college can cancel a class due to insufficient enrollment. Um, that's in here. Uh, it goes on in the second page to provide instructor guidelines that high school instructors teaching these courses have to have the same degree qualifications that RAC adjuncts have. Um, that the requirements in terms of assignments, tasks, assessments um, must fulfill the course competencies of the master syllabi. Uh, at the start of the academic year, high school instructors have to submit a course syllabi to their guidance counselors who forward that to RAC's Academic Affairs Office for review. Um, the text has to be approved by that division at the community college. Um, all high school instructors participate in a RAC program assessment as part of Middle States accreditation. And then goes into student guidelines in terms of college credit, how it's awarded by RAC to participating students upon successful completion, um, that those who enroll are uh, can enroll in courses at participating high schools are required to demonstrate the academic readiness for this work. They have to declare their intention to earn RAC credit through the dual enrollment courses prior to registering, that students and parents are responsible for all tuition charges and that students have to follow policies and regulations of the high school and the community college. Um, there's the grading system that they use. It's a plus minus grading system uh, with an A being 93% or higher and then it incrementally going down from there. Um, students are able to access their grade through a program there called self-service. And for 2021, uh, the prevailing tuition rate is $99 per credit. Um, but, um, you know, but they won't be charged any fees. And that's pretty consistent. Um, I believe at least since I've been here, I don't think that number has changed. I don't think RAC has, has bumped that number up any. It's been $99 just about every year. Um, and then, you know, the, the agreement has to be approved uh, by the board and then signed off by Dr. Phillips and Dr. Hemberger. 
So any questions about this agreement? And then I'll pull up the course list document as well. Patrick, I don't have a question about the agreement, but I do have a question about the implementation of this program in light of our current situation. I mean, uh, how, 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 how have we been um, providing this program during the course of, the, of our school closure? What about next year, you know, if we're not opening up, you know, in, in a regular fashion? How's, and that's, this is obviously a pre COVID-19 agreement with no kind of reference right. to any extraordinary conditions. What, what, what applies here? So that's a, that's a very good question and um, perhaps something that um, I should reach out, reach out to Rack in advance of next week. But my thought would be that um, everything that is, you know, taught under normal circumstances would be shifted to online and that, hey. Or, yes, Mr. Campbell. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you there. I, I can speak to that if you want. Please do. Yeah, so we, uh, we've we been working with uh, uh, Jody Corbett over at RAC, who's our liaison there from the beginning. Uh, she uh, um, wanted to make sure we in place that was necessary for us to meet the curricular requirements that they have. Uh, and if we didn't, they have online resources that they were prepared to offer us. Um, we had everything we needed and what our teachers did for those courses was they really just kept we left. So um, during that period of enrichment, um, that first two week block, we kind of let the, the dual enrollment teachers continue doing what they needed to do because they needed to meet those outside obligations and that was fine. They've continued to do that since the closure. And uh, I would imagine if we continue under similar circumstances in the fall, that we'll continue to meet those same requirements that way as well. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Uh, just a quick question. Does this also cover Exeter students who want to go to Rack and take courses? Or is it the other way around? Is it, is it our teachers offering college level courses? It's it's the latter. So all of these courses are taught in our classrooms by our teachers. And if they choose to pay for that discounted credit, the students will be transcripted those credits from RAC. Okay. Do we have students going to RAC? We do. Um, not many. Um, and off the top of my head, and I, I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly who or why, but I know we have a few. Um, I think from what I recall, some of them are, um, they're, they're on a non-traditional, um, and like they're, they're wrapping up early in there. Um, there may be situations where they're taking a course that we don't have in our dual enrollment catalog. Uh, we do allow students to transfer in certain credits. It's, it's very few. Okay, because my I taught there for six years. My best student over those six years was a junior from Conrad Weiser, uh, who took my composition course. So I was just curious to know if uh, if uh, could you at some time later on, Tom, could you get me numbers on how many Exeter students take RAC courses, say for the la over the last five years? Yeah, I can ask the counselors. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that there may be students that take courses at RAC that we don't even know about that don't end up on our transcript because we don't always, it, it, it's very, and it goes back to what we talked about earlier with, with AP and dual enrollment. Um, that ends up being a very individualized decision. So if a kid wants to use that for college credit, they may not they may decide not to apply that to their high school transcript because depending on where they're applying, it may not be transferred as a college course. Okay. But I, I can ask about what we know in terms of students who apply, who, who took courses there under our watch. Right. I guess I thought, I, I thought that's what part of this agreement was that if a, if, if a high school student took a course at RAC and, and did well in it, that that would transfer to his or her college and then and then for example if they took my composition class they wouldn't have to take composition in college is that not what this is all about 
is a general statement, yeah. But uh, what I was getting at is there are students that take courses uh, that may or may not, they, they can take a course outside of, they could take a course at RAC and never tell us. Um, but uh, generally, yes. But I think what we know from the college admissions and credit process is that it's never, generalizations are, are very, very tricky. Mr. Campbell, um, I thought that uh, if a student was still a high school student without a diploma, they had to get permission you know, from the school counselor or recommendation? Is it, you know, before they could take a college credit on their own outside of dual enrollment? Is that, you know, what, you know you about that? Right. You might be right. That may be, that may be true. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that would be a rack question. I mean, maybe the school counselors know also because I thought that they had to have permission to take a course that they hadn't graduated, but um, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's what it used to be true. anyway. So you yeah, might have no, a record. There might be a record of that too. My understanding is that if they want to use that as credit for our school district, they would need permission. We would be enrolling them. Yes. Correct. Okay, but you're saying if they're not using it for high school credit, they don't wouldn't need permission. They could certainly be doing it for pleasure, uh, language, an art, um, something they don't want to have on our on our transcript. They would not need our permission. Excuse me, I know there was a student in 2015 that actually graduated from RAC before he graduated from Exeter High School. The Eagle did a story on him. He was a former third grade student of mine. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. How many of our students take part in this dual enrollment as listed in this agreement? It, it's over 100. I was just trying to put my finger on that a minute ago. I, give me a couple minutes, I might be able to find it. Uh, I don't know if I have it here on my computer or in a paper file at school, but um, it's over 100. I, I wanna say 150, but I am not 100% sure about that. And it fluctuates a little bit from year to year. And there's, I'm gonna pull up also the course list. Um, these, these are the courses for next year um, that will be offered at the high school as dual enrollment. And you can see, you know, who the teachers are that, that teach them. And that's a fair number of courses. Um, it really is. Uh, in turn, you know, we've, we've got business courses, art courses, science courses, math, um, all the way down, and also social studies. So, is there anything new to that list that we didn't have on there last year? I don't believe so. Yes. Uh, oh, there is? Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Campbell. Yeah, uh, U.S. history was added in the last year. Okay. Um, because uh, we got Matt Burkhart certified. The, uh, some of the others, may, maybe some of the art studio, because that has, those requirements have changed over the last year or two, but I'm not positive. I, I, that may be, there's been a lot of ch change back and forth between prerequisites with uh, RAC and the college board for their, their similar AP studios. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Any additional questions either about the agreement or the course list? Okay, so the agreement uh, is on the board agenda this evening at workshop for discussion under curriculum committee. And then it will also be on next week on the voting meeting for approval and uh, provided it's approved by the board. Uh, then Dr. Hemberger and Dr. Phillips would sign it and then it would go back to RAC and we would be set for the 2021 school year for those courses. So for the next portion uh, of the meeting, uh, I, I, was, I was thinking a little bit outside the box for this meeting because as, as I kind of reflect on some of what has been happening during the pandemic, um, you know, we know all of the challenges that are out there but there's so much quality instruction that is going on by our teachers that I thought 
it would be a great opportunity, especially as we are in the month where we celebrate teachers for the great work that they do to kind of shine a spotlight on some of the quality instruction that's occurring in our buildings. And so I asked all the principals, and this is very, very hard to, you know, give me one person, just somebody that, you know, they thought was doing something really, really innovative um, that, you know, they thought would be really great to share. Um, some principals gave me a team, some principals gave me a couple folks. It's hard to narrow it down to just one. Um, and, you know, this list, I will say, barely scratches the surface. I mean, these are highlights of just some amazing things that are going on um, in our district. And so what I'm gonna do is uh, just about all of these folks are on the call with us tonight, which is fantastic. And so we're gonna share some of these different things, play some videos for you, and I'm gonna let the people, the teachers themselves, the experts, you know, talk you through some of what is involved and um, what these things have, have you know, been all about. So um, Devin, are you on the call? Were you able to join us? Yep, I'm here. Oh, fantastic, that's wonderful. So I'm gonna go ahead and share this video that um, Devin and the librarians put together and then I'm gonna let her share a little bit about uh, what went into this types of folktales video. So let me go ahead and play it for you. There is also sound here too. So um, the students actually hear my voice reading the text. Uh, they can follow along with it as they listen. So in this, in this, is it okay if I talk about it now or do you want to wait till the video is over? Let's kind of wait till it's over if you don't mind. Okay, sure. Was there any way we could hear the sound now, or? Can you guys yeah, the, the sound, the sound was the sound? playing. Okay, it's over now. Oh, What'd weird. you say? I'm sorry. Patrick, when you share underneath the, where you pick which window to share, there's a little checkbox that says share computer sound. Oh, okay. oh. good to know, good to know. Devin, do you want to talk through that for us a yeah, little bit? Sure. So there was there was some fun background music, and then my voice actually narrated all the text, but the students could also follow along. And that was just my introduction to different types of folk tales. Um, this lesson is a combination of literature and also some research, which are the two specials I teach, library and research. And I found this really cool. It's my simple slideshow. It's free for educators. And I just thought it was a really great way to, to to introduce a topic in a fun, quick, simple way. Um, and actually, I liked it so much, I, I shared it out with our staff at Lorraine, and I've had at least two teachers email me with, they've created math videos um, using it. So it's just really a, a quick way to, to introduce a, a topic. And then the lesson continued, we read, I read um, The Talking Eggs, and I used Wee Video to create that video and tell the students, you know, we're gonna be reading folk tales from all around the world, and. The Talking Eggs is a story from the American South from the 19th century. And then after the story was over, they did some research on World Book Online. Um, we're researching each place the stories originate. And then they share that in like, a, I call it a, a digital passport. It's really a Google Slides project. Thank you, Devin. Sure. 
I think what's really cool about this is, you know, we talk about the importance and value of reading and, you know, our students get to experience these kinds of reading examples, um, you know, told, you know, by our librarians. Um, and it just really, you know, further emphasizes the importance and power of literacy. And, um, you know, as somebody whose tech skills are not near the level of Devon's, I love this slideshow tool. I think it's very, very creative. And, um, you know, I'm sure the students really enjoyed it as well. So thank you, Devin, thanks oh, for sure. being here. Thanks for sharing. Honestly, the hardest part being a librarian is that we're, you know, we're used to being able to recommend books and we know our kids and, oh, well, if you've read this one, we're gonna suggest this one. So for right now, the hardest part is like, we just, we wanna get books back in kids' hands. So that's why each week we are sending out um, 10 eBooks that students can choose to read if, if they'd like to, just because, you know, we're not actually physically putting them in their hands, but we still wanna share with them. That's great, that's great, thank you. Um, so um, the, the next building where we wanted to highlight some things is Zawatan Creek Elementary and um, Mr. Bertolette and also Mrs. Moyer. Uh, Mr. Bertolette, are you with us? Yes, yes Fantastic. I'm here. So um, I've asked, um, Mr. Mr. Bertolette's gonna talk to us about what he's doing with Dreambox and the Dreambox math competition. So I'll let you talk about that a little bit, please. Okay, uh, I will say I'm glad you didn't have any of my videos up here because I'd be slightly embarrassed for everyone <laughs> to watch my videos. Um, but, you know, Dreambox, I, I, I love it, all right? Um, and it's, it's a great way to differentiate for the students. Uh, the more they can get on, the more they can excel, the kids that need the extra help can get it. So what I decided to do with our, in our building is have a challenge to see which class in third grade can complete the most lessons at the end of each week. And at the end of each week, I will come on with a video. You know, I will say, I'll rank, you know, Miss Bond's class got fifth place with like 79 lessons, you know, and the first place, you know, I, I last week when my class won, I had a, I had a wrestling belt and I was like, yeah, we won. And all the other kids were like, oh my gosh, I can't believe Mr. Burlett did that. And uh, this week, if you would watch it, my team lost and I gave Mrs. Moyer's class a little baby tiny trophy because they won. But I bring humor into it and I, you know, it's a way to motivate the kids. And I feel like that's, that's what my goal is with this right now. Because when the kids are at home, I mean, I have my own kids and, you know, it's like kicking them in the pants to try to get them to do their work. You know, how can I kick our kids in the pants and, and pump them up and have some humor with it? And I feel like Dreambox is the way to do it. And you know, I'm getting good results with it. I, I just looked at some of my stats this, this past month. I've had over a thousand lessons complete. 70 to 75% of the kids are doing it. Um, so, you know, I really feel it's working and, I, and I'm glad that, you know, Exeter supports that and, you know, what we're doing with it. But, you know, I'm having a lot of fun with it. I think the kids are having a lot of fun with it. Um, so it's going really well. Thanks, Mr. Bertolet. Thank you for sharing that. It, you know, Dreambox has been, it's been a great resource and we continue to see teachers kind of taking it and doing creative things with it and you know students love competition you know they love to to have goals and you know things that they can reach and you know your enthusiasm um with that and kind of bringing that into the third grade team collectively i think that's fantastic so thanks thanks for sharing that and i know um you know the work in Dreambox. you know hopefully once we get you know back in you know, the swing of things in a building and, you know, assessments come back. I think we'll see that bear fruit in PSSA and PBAS, you know, uh, you know, data as well, not only in your classroom, but across the third grade team at, at Owatton Creek. So thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. That. Thank you. So, well, I have just one question, Mr. Burlett. So you said it's like 70 to 75% of the students are doing the dream box. Is yes. That's well, 70 to 75% are hitting their goal. Uh, which is usually about five, they expect the kids to get about five lessons per week, um, you know, or like 30 minutes per week. So 70 to 75% are hitting that goal. You know, out of my whole class, I probably have, you know, there are some kids that only go on for 15 minutes a week that maybe didn't complete a lesson. Um, but, you know, 70 to 75 are completing what they need to, what Dreambox's uh, goals for them are. So the, the other ones then, they're still come, going on and logging, just not getting to the goals? That's correct, that's okay. correct. Do you have some students who aren't logging on at all or aren't doing it? To Dreambox? Yes. Um, I would say it, it, most of the time they're all logging on. 
I did it. I incorporated it a lot uh, when we were in school. Like, we, you know, Miss, uh, we did it. I did it like almost every day. So the, the process for them to get on was, was fairly easy. And I feel like once it was sent home to them to get on, that they could, they could do that, you know, they could do that pretty well. And I, and I had them do that for homework at times too. So I have a pretty good turnout. I can't say that it's necessarily definitely like that throughout the whole building. Um, but I do, yeah, I, most of my kids are getting on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The other teacher who's with us um, from uh, Awatton Creek, that same third grade team, uh, Carol Moyer, um, we're going to share some really great work that she's doing with science in terms of lava lamps and chemical reactions. And um, Carol, I think what I'm going to do, since the actual science video is a yeah. little bit longer, uh, you know, I might share like a clip of that, maybe two, two and a half minutes, then we'll look at some of the other pieces as well, if that's okay. Okay. Okay, before we do that, I just wanted to say something about Joe's stream box because he's way too humble, but um, my own children are at home right now. They're college students and they watch his stream box video uh, challenge um, because he is so humorous and so motivating. Um, and he gets on with his wrestling belt. And at one of my class meetings, I had a mother, you know, that has watched Joe's videos get on and say, well, Mrs. Moyer, if your class wins this year, I'm going to bring um, my child's brother's wrestling belt to your house. So my class did win this week and she drove, well, she had her husband bring it to my house because she was working at home. They drove the wrestling belt up here for me to make my own video and it's created, I mean, I've had children this past week do 36 lessons. 16 lessons, 17 lessons, 50 lessons, because Joe has hyped it up so much. And quite frankly, um, he's added so much humor, which kids really need during this time period, um, and, and motivation also. And for me, you know, the, the best thing about the Dream Box is that, you know, we're presenting all these lessons to kids virtually, but Dream Box does such a great job of differentiating because we have children of all different levels in our rooms and Dreambox will assess their performance and adjust the level to where the child is, whether they need some remedial review, basic on the concepts, or maybe the child is whizzing through things and it's taking them to higher level math. Um, and it's so easy for us to look at the data as to the lessons completed, um, the standards that they're proficient in. So just during this strange time period, I think we really are doing uh, so nicely at keeping tabs on where they're at with their math through, through Dreambox. That's great. That's yeah. great. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little lava lamps and chemical yeah. reactions. And so I'm going to, and okay. I will... Maybe we should, do you think that it would be beneficial to have sound, Carol? Because I know for mine, I'll want the computer sound. Yeah, so yeah I figured out how to fix that tip. Oh, I figured yay. it out. <laughs> okay. I figured it out. And Dev and I apologize that I hadn't figured it out for yours. That's that's my fault. But um, let me get to, all right. This is my kitchen. <laughs> let me just, okay, share, okay. So I'm pretty sure we'll have sound. You guys hear that? Hi, it's Mrs. Moore. Yes. We're yes. going to be doing some science in our kitchen. You've all seen lava lamps, and we're going to just use some ordinary things around the house to make our own lava lamps. First, you'll need water, and then you'll need some glasses, any shape, any size. I have a cookie sheet underneath them just to catch any spills. You're also going to need vegetable oil and food coloring. And I have to mention, food coloring can stain your clothing, so you want to be really careful with that. Also, you're going to need Alka-Seltzer tablets. Now, this is a kind of medicine, so you want to have your parents' permission and what Alka-Seltzer is, is a tablet made of medicine for upset stomachs. Part of it is a pain reliever, which contains aspirin, and another part of it is baking soda. Now, the name for baking soda is sodium bicarbonate. Um, 
And what it does when you take this, if you have a stomach ache, is it reduces the acid level in your stomach. It kind of calms your stomach. And you should never take this like it's a candy or you should never take this on your own. You only ever want to use this with the parent's permission. Um, so this is an experiment that you need to do with a parent. And you also want to make sure that these tablets are not near a younger brother or sister that might chew on them by accident or they might pick their candy. So we really want to be careful of that. Now, with the Alka-Seltzer tablets, it's kind of a large tablet and you're only going to need small pieces. So you're going to break it in half and then break it in half again. So when you're done, you will have four pieces. So you're breaking that large tablet into fourths. And don't worry about them being totally equal. It's probably hard to do that. So we put that there. The Alka-Seltzer tablets usually come in a little pouch. And we really want to be careful that we only do this when a parent is around. Okay, so to start our lava lamps, um, we're going to fill the glasses about this far with water and I like to kind of sketch out what I'm doing before I start my experiment. So I'll be sharing my notes with you later. So you're going to fill about a quarter of the cup with just plain water. then maybe that looks a little higher than a quarter cup. Okay, not that much. And you're going to pick your favorite food coloring. Let's see, and remember, food coloring does stain clothing, so we have to be really careful with that. Okay, so I'm going to start out with blue. One, two, three, four, five drops. Okay, and then I'm going to do green, one, two, three, four, five drops, and then yellow, one, two, three, four, five drops. Now, feel free to experiment with colors. You can blend colors to make other colors. That's a neat... Um... I would love to play the full... <laughs> The, yeah, the full nine minutes. I was like totally into that. I was kind of getting, you know, getting kind of lost in it. But, um, you know, there are some other yeah. pieces here. Um, yeah. And the, the the next one is um, this was your this was kind of the finished product. Well, the, and this is the instruction, and this is a discussion of the science concepts behind, you know, just the trick. You know. Um, okay. Now let's start to think about you making your own lava lamp in your kitchen with things you just happen to have around the house. First, you're going to need water. You're going to need some glasses um, or maybe recycled glass jars. Any shape will do. Cooking oil and some food coloring and Alka-Seltzer tablets. Now, food coloring is non-toxic. So even if somebody swallows it, it's not harmful. And it's in liquid, and we use five drops per container. Then we have Alka-Seltzer tablets. So that was more the instruction, like kind of the actual lesson, right, Carol? Yeah, right. then I go into what an emulsion is, and because we talk about how the oil and the water does not mix, um, we I do a graph of what a fourth looks like with um, the tablet. Um, so it's you know, it's kind of learning the concepts behind the craft or the trick in the kitchen. Um, and, then, yeah, and then you sent me some student examples, which yeah. is this right here. So, yeah. so wanted you guys to see this as well. So you've seen the science experiment being taught. You've also seen the science mini lesson explaining the concepts behind the experiment. Well, now let's look at what students actually did. One of the things that the students are um, told is optional is that they can upload pictures of the experiment if they chose to do it. Here we have a picture of a little boy that was re-watching the experiment for the second time and doing it on his own. And you can see a little bit of his um, two younger sisters on either side of him also enjoying the experiment.
And I think as a teacher, just seeing their um, expressions and reactions to it is the best part. But when they choose to do the experiment and upload the photo, that is optional. And they are also given the chance to write a caption, to post a caption and their comments about the experiment. And these pictures were uploaded onto Schoology and the students got to view each other's. And I think one of the neatest things was how their siblings tend to get involved. This is a little boy in my class and his second grade sister who also loved the experiment and did it with him. Now um, we have a third grader on the left. We have a fourth grade brother in the middle who's also can't help but be interested in it. And a little kindergarten um, brother also getting into the act. And a lot of the students chose to do the extension by putting it in a dark room and shining a flashlight under the bottom of it. And they took their photo and posted this. And the students were encouraged to go on and look at each other's posted photo and make comments also. And with this experiment, you know, we always tell the parents, your students are not expected to have to do the experiment. We do want you to watch the experiment being done. We want you to watch the science mini lesson. But in this age and time of stay at home, we don't want anyone running out to Walmart or running to Giant for one um, material that you need for a science experiment. But if you choose to do the experiment when it's good for your family, that's just even better. And what we try and do is I will post the materials for the Friday science lesson and also the next Friday science lesson. So they really have two weeks notice as to what they need. Now, with this experiment, they need. So, um, I, you know, I think that, you know, those those three videos give you a really, really great picture of how even virtually we can take science, which is a very hands-on subject and make it come to life and make it meaningful for kids. And, um, it, you know, I mean, it was, I mean, uh, you know, Carol, even as, as somebody who's, you know, 45 and not teaching elementary school, I, I found myself getting caught up in, you know, in everything because of just, you know, how creative that is. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that and, and, and making, you know, sharing that with everybody. It's good stuff. Sure. And I'm not sure why, but the video like ran smoother on Schoology. It, um, I don't know if it's, I don't, I don't know the technology behind it, but it runs a little bit smoother um, when it's posted. And then we also followed up with uh, a virtual tour of a real lava lamp factory and how they're actually, you know, the history of them and how they're actually made. Nice. Dr. McClendon, do you have a question? No, I was just going to say, thank you, Mrs. Boyer. I mean, that is that is really awesome. I used to teach elementary school, so I'm really uh -huh. impressed with what you're doing, you know, what all of you are doing. But do you, so you said every two weeks, do you do an, uh, an experiment? No, they had told us that they would like um, a, a hands-on science experiment each week. So the thing that I just feel so thankful for is that we were allowed to kind of split up all the subjects, like Mr. Bertolette's doing math and other teachers specializing in social studies and so on. I do reading strategies, and then every Friday there's a science hands-on lesson. But, you know, I do stress that I don't want anybody running out for something, you know, one thing. Um, I know like at Easter, food coloring was sold out and um, my aide actually brought it to me. But so I always go through the whole entire experiment so they can see it and do it at another time. But then they are expected to watch the instructional, um, like Google slide presentation that explains the science concepts. And then um, it's of course optional to upload pictures and they love to do that and parents have sent me videos of their children doing it um and it, it's so cute to hear the kids you know narrate it and everything but um i also try and on schoology put an announcement on monday giving this friday's materials they'll need and the following fridays just so they have heads up and they can put it on the grocery list but you know the alka seltzer was kind of the rarest thing they needed other things were like vinegar, empty egg cartons, pepper, detergent, uh, cornstarch, you know, really common household things. So. Great. That's great. Um, yeah, thank you. You know, the next one, um, you know, if you ever wondered um, what music instruction looks like online, 
Um, our next one, uh, we have Patty Klein with us from Riften, and um, she did some, you know, collaboration and created some content with some other music educators and did a Star Wars week um, with the Riften band. So I'm going to kind of pull this up and, um, it, you know, Patty, I'll just kind of let you kind of talk about it a little bit if there, you know, are certain slides you want me to go to or certain things you want me to play, just let me know and I can do that. Okay. Uh, most of my instruction, I see kids once a week with the ensemble, so it's mostly technical and learning how to actually play the instrument. We do not actually get to hit the history behind the musical selection that they're studying a lot, just based on our time. So in this quarantine, one of the things I had the opportunity to do is really give them a history lesson on the, the music they've been studying to perform so much, but we're not performing it. Star Wars is a big thing. It is a main theme that's iconic in the last uh, 50 years and it stayed iconic so I thought it would be a great um, subject to expose my students to a little more history and a little more vocabulary on the various themes. They studied the main theme but the Star Wars soundtracks have about 20 recognizable themes so this is a slide presentation and a little interactive quizzing about the different themes. It's really great. So there's music links and they have to pick and then they also see what the melody is and then they have to identify when you click on the characters they will hear the theme for that and then later on they have to choose between which one is correct. It's really cool. So you can see on the bottom you can actually see the melody that they would hear. I'm not sure why I'm not hearing a sound. Okay. That's the main melody, the Imperial March. Um, uh, that's the images. There's a website you can remove background okay. for transparent. So you put the image and you type in the word transparent and then you can superimpose it on a background. And I, you know, Patty, can you, know, can, can you share a little bit about, you know, my understanding is, you know, you were able to kind of, you know, collaborate with some other music teachers and kind of, you know, put this together, which I thought was a really cool way of doing it. And so I wonder if you can kind of share a little bit about that too. Yes, um, I'm a member of a Facebook group called Music Learning Online, and it literally has thousands of members and teachers, are in a very collaborative spirit and creative spirit. This quarantine, you know, has awoken creativity, I believe, among all teachers. And, and so each person tries to do a little part of it and then builds on the next one. So someone found the images, another person uploaded the slide, then I, uh, another teacher came up with the leitmotif idea. And they originally did the four main characters in the original film, and then I expanded on the further films like Kylo Ren, and the emperor and things like that. And when you share a document on a national level, sometimes there's a sound limit, that there's a limit you can access sound files. So you need to copy them, recreate them, and re-upload everything. So we learned a little bit about the sharing, um, making sure that where you save your files is in a location that there's no limit. Thanks, but Patty. This is... And I've shared many ideas, and it's, it's, it's really awoken the creativity and I see this format as something I can do with other parts of music history to share with my kids. Yeah, you know, I think this is fantastic. And I think, you know, it's a great example of how I think our specialists in particular have had to get real creative in terms of figuring out how to make their content come to life in an online setting. And, you know, we really talk about the value of collaboration and collaboration still occurs online. And so, you know, if we had more time, I'd you know click through you know many more of these, but all of these are linked on the agenda online, and you know I would encourage you to go back and test your Star Wars history at some point in time. So thank you. Um, jumping back to math a little bit, we've got some really good things happening at Jacksonwald in fourth grade. So I'm going to go ahead and um, play this fourth grade math video, and then we'll let Tiff say a few words about that.
Morning, fourth grade friends. Today in math, we're going to be looking at unit 6.2.1 and 6.2.2. Is there a different way to write this fraction? I want you to take a moment and think about it. Is there a different way to write that? And I want you to think about, well, what does the numerator and the denominator mean? So my first thing is, is I need to say, well, I have two equal pieces. But I need three of those, so where am I going to find a third piece? Let's pretend that this is a sandwich, and I, I have three for... Hello, fourth grade. This is Mel here. Um, I have my... We can put some fractions on the number line. So I heard that some of my fourth graders were um, having a little bit of trouble understanding how you could place fractions on a number line. So I made a number line in my dining room. Half got three six because big fractions are all about relationships. And three is half of six. So three six is equal to one half. One half, of course, that's an easy one to put there. And then two fourths, two is half of four. So two fourths is equivalent to one half. Hey everybody, I am jumping in to give you guys some help on this worksheet for today. This is the math worksheet for more fractions on the number line. So when I look at here, five twelfths. Well, I know that those landmark numbers are gonna be zero, half, one, and two. So I know that this has to go somewhere on this number line. Well, I need to think about my number sense here. I know the number 12. Well, if I need to relate it on anywhere on here, one whole would actually be 12 twelfths. And that's not the case here. This is 5 twelfths. So I'm going to look here at one half. So I know it's going to be less than one whole. Now, one half, though, half of 12 is actually 6. So that would be 6 twelfths. Well, I don't have 6 twelfths. I have 5 twelfths. So I need to think of the relationship then between 6 and 5. 5 is less than 6. So Hi, fourth grade. It's Mrs. Adams coming to you this week to um, do some math with you. So today we're going to be doing lesson 6.3.4, which is more adding and subtracting fractions. And I'm, I'm going to kind of break it there. Just, I'm sorry, Tiff, but you know, in the uh, in the interest of time, we have to make sure we keep going. But what else would you like to add to that? Well, first of all, mine was in less than five minutes. The, I'll, I'll get that in there. I just had to say that. Yeah. But anyway. Um, I, I just took a bunch of videos that we had done and I compiled them. We've been dividing and conquering um, the work. So thank you um, to whoever made the decision that we were allowed to collaborate like that. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you um, to the school board, um, to our administrators, and also to the tech department because fourth grade was one-to-one -one this year. And um, I think that that has made our transition to this online learning so much smoother um, because the kids were already familiar with um, the online applications. We, we use them daily, like um, Joe Bertolette was saying with Dreambox, like we've been using that all year, every day on our Chromebooks. So for them using that now, it was, it was seamless. Um, they were already familiar with logging in and with navigating the district devices. Uh, I've seen firsthand through my colleagues how difficult it has been for those kiddos that weren't one-to-one -one, um, to navigate and to learn all of this very quickly in a short amount of time, which of course they have done, but it wasn't nearly as smooth. So um, I know that we're going into a, a year where our budget, <laughs> we're, we're not exactly um, in a surplus, but just you know, thinking again, going back to that one-to-one, you know, not knowing what next year has in store for us. I just think it's it's been such a blessing for fourth grade. And I just wanted to get that out there and say thank you. Thank you for making that decision. Um, it's really, it's made a world of difference this year. Thanks, Tiff. Um, and then, um, you know, we have a couple things from our secondary as well. Um, you know, and I will just say that um, I would certainly encourage everybody um, as you have time to click on all these links and even watch the remainder um, of 
you know, what is on some of these videos. Um, you know, I'm going to ask Sean to, to talk about some of the stuff he's doing at the high school around physics. Um, I'm not going to play those two videos, but they are linked there. I apologize for that, Sean. I'm trying to be mindful of time. And um, I, know, I, know, I know everybody's stuff is amazing, but if you can talk a little bit about kind of what you've been doing um, around physics and, and with these videos. Sure. So um, several weeks ago, I was just trying to think of ways to sort of switch up what I was doing and make things more interesting uh, for students. And I'd kind of been inspired by um, different stories I've, I've heard on the news or on social media of like teachers that are able to pull famous people into like Google Meets and stuff. You know, and I was thinking and I was like, well, I'm not really interested in famous people, but, you know, there's a few YouTube channels that I use for teaching um, people that have uh, physics backgrounds and just do a really good job of making their content entertaining. Um, and so I decided to reach out to them with no expectation, really, that anything would come of it. But um, just like on a lark, I... I touched base with both Physics Girl and uh, Nick Lucid from the channel Science Asylum. And uh, Physics Girl got back to me first. Um, and she uh, asked me some information about Exeter, you know, where I teach and that sort of thing. And she made a personalized video uh, for my physics students to kind of encourage them and uh, lift their spirits during quarantine. And then uh, a few days later, I heard back from Nick Lucid, um, and he also runs a YouTube channel called Science Asylum. And um, so we did a little bit of haggling back and forth over schedules, and we were able to, to work out a time for a Google Meet um, last Friday. So uh, we had about a dozen people in on that call, and we talked to him for about an hour. And one thing that really amazed me was how interdisciplinary of a conversation it really wound up being. Um, you know, obviously we're interested in the physics, but uh, he talked to the kids about how he, how he does the editing for his videos and the script writing process in terms of um, getting an idea for a video to taking it to a finished product. And um, like I have one student right now who uh, has been on E4 in the past, uh, doing the weather and he was just like so interested to talk to another digital content creator um, like that. So I thought it was really cool to create those connections. Um, and Dan and Misty did a great job of helping me set it up and kind of brainstorm in terms of what the uh, what the best idea was going to be for format. Um, and one thing I, I told each of them afterwards in an email was that, um, you know, it's tough, obviously, having to teach online, but this is the kind of opportunity that wouldn't even exist without technology. Um, you know, when you talk about the acronym SAMR, which has come up uh, in, in services with us before, um, rather than just using technology to substitute uh, things that we're already doing in the classroom, this is like the R, the redefinition where uh, you know, without being one-to-one -one and without having technology like Google Meets, this this concept wouldn't have even existed. So I just thought it was cool to like really rethink uh, what I've been doing in the classroom. classroom. Thanks, Sean. That's great. Um, and, you know, again, another example of that collaboration um, online. And then junior high, um, Cindy jurasinski boyers with us. She's a social studies teacher and also the department chair up there who's gonna talk a little bit about what, what she's been doing with, with social studies online. Cindy? Yeah, we, we've, we're continuing to expand some of the things that we're doing. Um, a number of us are using things like Pear Deck and Flipgrid and a lot of the things that we are using to communicate with our students. So I'm just gonna share briefly how this looks. Um, hold on if I can. I need to share my screen and it won't allow me to. It might not, Cindy, because I'm okay. the host. So okay. <laughs> well, then I'll just talk through all the things. Um, so uh, you can grant her by clicking the arrow and saying, um, "Actually, I can do it too." Go ahead, try now, Cindy. Thanks, Joe. Yep. Okay, so let me see where I am. So 
Let's see if we get this. So as you, you know, when we go in and we set up our lessons, um, we try and settle it up so that we have three weeks and within our lesson, um, it's gonna let me do that. We have our objectives and some of the things that we wound up doing, I don't know if it's let me go back now. Um, hold on. So some of the things that we've used, uh, I've used Pear Deck. I don't know if anybody else out there, I think, um, Patty Klein, you're using some of this. And unfortunately, because of technical difficulties, I can't pull in everything. My uh, user is not connecting to it, but it allows them to walk through the, and, and what I've done, this is not the exact way it should be, but um, what I've done through each slide, if we can get there, again, some technical difficulties. Um, each slide, and I'll just, uh, has different, ways to input their information and they're able to do things like drawing and adding and um, giving their opinion and um, I've edited and walked through it so it's like a screencastify but it has a lot more um, involvement of the students so that's some of the things that um, we've been doing also um, with the um, with the trail guide um, we're doing the uh, they're on the trail and then they come and they play the game and then they respond back to it. And then next week, gonna take their experiences and mold that in sort of a journal of what they're doing. So they'll add on to that. Um, some of the other things that they have been doing, again, Screencastify is part of it. And if I can get to a couple other things, there are some ed puzzles that we've put together within our department with different questions and responses for them to share out. And uh, many of you are familiar with Flipgrid and Flipgrid is a way to post a question. And what I've done is I've posted a lot of um, pros and con questions. And this is just one student who is giving her response. And, and Cindy, if you um, can like, I don't know, send me a link at some point tonight, tomorrow or whatever, I'll link it on the agenda. So when the minutes go out, you know, people have access to it since we weren't able to see it via screen. Okay. So, you know, by way of, of, of kind of, um, you know, wrapping up the meeting, um, we've got a board meeting in a couple minutes that some of you may be jumping on to. Um, you know, I just want to say um, kind of publicly and corporately, I appreciate all the work that teachers are doing. Those of you that jumped on the call this evening, I appreciate you being in the Zoom call, being able to share with us some of what you're doing. Um, and, you know, I wish we had had more time, we could have gone in more detail, but, you know, you've given everybody a taste of some of the great stuff that's happening, and um, I appreciate that. So, you know, thank you. Thank you for all that you do. And um, when we meet next month as a curriculum committee, we're going to talk a little bit about how we're going to address summer regression and kind of what those curriculum and instruction plans are as we enter into the next school year. We should have more information at that time. So thank you all. Um, have a wonderful evening and um, take care, be safe. Good job. Thank you all. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.